Hello, everyone. How are we doing today? I hope everybody's doing great today. Well, um, first of all, uh, I have a little uh, something I need to share with you. Uh, first of all, welcome to Clinical Skills Online, uh, where we learn some clinical skills and have a bit of fun while we do that. Uh, also, today, we're going to be talking about the neurological exam. But before we start today, I need to tell you something that happened. Unfortunately, uh, I just found out this morning that the simulation center became unavailable. So we had like a huge change of plans and unfortunately uh, we're not at the simulation center today. So uh, we're going to be changing a little bit our topic for today. We're still gonna do physical exam, but we're gonna be focusing on the cranial nerves mostly. Okay, the rest we're not going to be able to do uh, today, unfortunately, but uh, if this is something that you are interested in, we can schedule it for a later time. But today, we're going to be focusing on cranial nerve exam. And this is extremely useful because uh, many times you get patients that come in with something like a stroke or TIA, right? Uh, transient ischemic attack. And then kind of you, you really want to make sure to see if there's any neurological deficit. So today we're going to be doing cranial nerves all the way from number one to number 12. I'm sure you remember the names of each one of them, right? 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 Oh, no, maybe not. No, don't worry. I also forget all the time. But um, it's really important to try to, to uh, kind of more or less remember. We're going to be reviewing each of the cranial nerves. And then we're going to be doing a quick demonstration of, um, of each of them. So, so we're going to have a chance to do that. Okay, great. So uh, again, uh, very sorry for the inconvenience. Sometimes these things happen, right? And uh, anyway, we're going to get a chance to, to do our, our class today, and it's still going to be awesome. So, so no worries. And we're going to have a great time as we go through our class today. Okay, so before we start today, just quick question. How is everybody feeling today? How are you doing? Good? Bad? So-so? Joanna says... Hi, hi, Joanna. Hi, Apple. James. Praise is also online with us today. Hello, guys. Welcome to the stream. Okay, so very quickly on the chat, if you can tell us how are you doing today, we have a good from Michael. I am wearing a mask. Do you know why? Because today we have some help. We have an SP who's going to be helping us today. I'm going to introduce her in a few minutes, and that's why. I have this mask. I know. I know. Hi, Erin. How is everybody doing? Jane. Okay. Good to see you all. And uh, let's get started with this today. So uh, today we're going to be talking about the cranial nerve exams. And of course, as you guys remember, cranial nerve number one is the olfactory nerve, right? And the function of this is mostly related to our sense of smell, right? So, uh, and the test we use for this is smell, something called smell discrimination. Now, I do ask you to keep in mind that for a very long time, we didn't use this very often, right? We didn't do it so much. Uh, but now with COVID, uh, anosmia is a, a serious symptom that sometimes appears in patients who have COVID. So actually people have started doing this much more often than before. So it's a really, really interesting find. So we're going to talk about how we do the exam of the olfactory nerve. And hopefully our P exam, our, our P camera will be working today. Uh, I, I hope. Uh, let's do a quick sound check. Okay, P cam. Um, can you guys hear me okay? It should be working. Give me a little yes if, if, if you can hear us. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Praise. Awesome, awesome. Also, if you guys notice, your chat now appears on the screen on the lower right corner. So I can see your chat, so, so it's really cool now. Okay, very good. So I'm glad you can hear us. And today, I'd like to start by introducing a good friend, Mizuho, who have agreed to come in today and help us out with our class. Right. So, so thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we're going to start by talking about the olfactory nerve. But before we do anything, it's time for you guys know what? Hand cleaning, right? So very important, always sanitize your hands before you work with any patient, right? And that way you know that everybody is safe and everything is good. Um, it's a good idea to always like 
really rub your hands well because sometimes people just go like psh, psh, and then suddenly they're they're done right so so it's a good idea to really rub your hands properly when you're doing this and dry your hands a little bit because especially if you're going to be near the patient's eyes sometimes the vapor from the alcohol uh can, can irritate the eyes so always make sure you dry your hands you can shake them a little bit before right and that way you make sure you have nice uh clean hands before you start working with your patient okay very good so let's uh, let's go to Mizuho and uh uh, so for our first exam today, what we're going to do is we're I'm going to be testing your sense of smell. Okay, so I'm going to put a little bit of alcohol here on this cotton ball, and what I would like you to do is would it be possible for you to lower your mask, please? Okay, and I want you to please cover uh, one side of your of your nose like this. There we go. That's it, and close your eyes. Okay, can you smell this? What can you smell? Uh, hand sanitizer. Hand sanitizer. Very good. Okay, let's try the other side. Same thing. So unblock your nose. Try the other one. Okay. What can you smell? Same. The same. Okay. Is the smell the sense of smell the same on both sides? Mm -hmm. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Okay. Very good, everybody. So this was our olfactory nerve exam. So I used hand sanitizer because that's what we usually have available. But in some cases, um, especially if you're working in a more specialized office or something, you will have access to other things. Very commonly, we use coffee or cinnamon to do this test because it's much more sensitive. But if you don't have that available, we can do for hand sanitizer. Most important thing is the patient needs to cover one of the nostrils while you do the test and then cover another of the nostrils while you do the other side. And eyes should be closed as in any neurological exam. Cool. If any questions come up as we're going through, please feel free to interrupt me, and then we can we can just kind of uh, take the, take your question from there. Okay. Good. Cranial nerve number one. Okay. Cranial nerve number two is the optic nerve, and this this one is a bit more challenging. Right. This one's a bit more difficult to examine. There's several parts to it, um, and there's several different tests that we can do. Vision is a very complex sense, right? So so there are many many things that you can explore when you're evaluating somebody's vision. So very, very important to, to kind of really do a good visual test, uh, especially if patients complain of visual disturbance or something, then it would be very indicated to do this kind of examination. Um, before we, we move on to our P, uh, let me just quickly uh, do a little review with you about the optic nerve. So here we're gonna see in our P cam, we have the optic nerve over here. Let's remove some of this muscle. And here we can observe the disposition of that optic nerve. Now, there's one thing I want to really emphasize with you is that the midline is kind of located here like this, or like the mark I'm making there. So the optic disc is always a little bit medial, right? So if we, if we divide the eye in, in, in two, we're gonna find it's a little bit medial. Usually there's about, about a 15 degree angle here. And that's really important when we start talking about fundoscopy. But this is a very very interesting thing that we can do and again it's a very complex nerve lots of things happening here so we need to make sure that we try to do as best exam as we can when we're when we're doing the examination of the eye okay very good so let's switch to our other camera and let's uh let's start talking about the examination of the eye okay so as we said before there are several things we're going to examine one of them is visual acuity, right? And visual acuity is, is something that we usually use a Snellen chart for. And just very quickly, I can show you an example that I have right over here. Let's switch to that for a second. Okay, and I have a Snellen chart over here. Uh, in countries that use Roman alphabet, it usually looks like this, but I've seen here in Taiwan, it has like a little C. Is that correct? You guys use the, the one that's a, like a little C like this and C and like this and like this? Yeah, do, do you usually use that one? Yeah, so usually, yes, praise. that's a good point. Uh, so yeah, sometimes patients lie and, and that's, that's something that unfortunately there's not much we can do about. When we're doing a sensory exam, we always rely on the patient's honest answer. And if, if a patient is not in capacity to give those answers, then it can be very difficult to make the diagnosis. So, so that's a very, very good point you're making. And uh, 
this is particularly relevant when you're working with patients who have dementia or some other altered state of consciousness, it is very difficult to do this test. So actually, even for this one here, the, the Snellen chart, actually people lie about it too. Oh, this, this way, sorry. Even, even for the Snellen chart, people lie because they go in to get their driver's license exam and they want to pretend that they have good vision, right? So sometimes people lie for this one too. Uh, I, I heard about this one individual who memorized the lines that he needed to read. And uh, it was at the end they found out and they took away his driver's license. But I guess, you know, there's always somebody who will try something funny. But anyway, okay, so this is the first one. We, we get the patient to read from right to left or from left to right, right? And then we, we do that. And as you guys know, we have different levels of vision. 2020 is the normal, right? So hopefully we'll all be 2020 when we do the exam. But if there's a change in the visual ability, we're going to see some different scores with the patient. And we stop where the patient is no longer able to accurately read the character, right? Or in the case of, of Taiwan and other Asian countries, you use that C-shaped um, kind of like little half donut thing. Uh, so again, we can use those as well. Okay, great. So going back here, our next step is to talk about visual fields. And this is another interesting test. And believe it or not, people make a lot of mistakes when doing this. And this is why I would like to review this particular exam with you today. Okay, very good. So let's go to visual fields. And um, the first thing is we need to give some instructions to our patient about what's going to happen. So uh, first of all, we explain, okay, musical, what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be testing your vision. Okay. And what I would like you to do is can you please cover your eye with your hand like this? Okay, very good. So we have to do each eye separately, right? That's really important. Okay, now that we have the patient over here, we're going to position ourselves in front of the patient directly. So we want to make sure that the patient has a direct line with us. We're going to cover the same eye just like she's doing, right? And then I'm going to place my hand at, the, at a distance that is the same from me to the patient, okay? It's very, very important because many times if you put your hand here, then she's going to be able to see this even if you don't. If you put the hand too far, uh, she won't be able to see it, but you will be able to see it. So you want to find the midpoint between you and the patient. It doesn't have to be 100% exact, but you want the hand to be more or less at the same distance between both people. So we, we put our hand here. And what we're going to do, Ms. Ho, is when I move my finger like this, I want you to point at it with your finger. Okay, so let's give it a little try. Like this, and you point. Very good. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to push my hand away to the limits of my peripheral vision. So I'm looking at her eye and I'm moving my hand away from her to the limits of my peripheral vision and the distance between us is quite similar. So now I can proceed and try it. And she's able to identify the movement. Okay, we can do it up here as well. Okay, she's able to identify the movement and then we can do it down here. And she's able to identify the movement and then we can do it on the opposite side. Sorry, it's hard to see this one. And she's able to identify the movement. Okay, so what we're doing here is I'm comparing her visual fields against mine. Yeah, and hopefully I'll be normal, right? That's that's kind of if you don't have normal visual visual fields, then you probably should not be doing this test. But again, this allows us to identify blind spots or decreases in vision, like hemianopsia or some other types of changes. So it's a really useful test that you can do very easily. But again, the most important thing is the distance between your hand and your eye has to be the same as the patient. Because if not, then this test is absolutely useless, right? And many times I see people doing it here or doing it there, it doesn't work, okay? So the distance is critical. The most important thing is it has to be a very similar distance from your finger to your eye and the finger to your patient's eye. So I can't emphasize that enough. That, that's super important, super important. Okay, great. So going back, let's take a look at our next test. We're going to be doing pupillary light reflex, right? And usually what we do with this is we, we shine uh, a little light on, on the patient's um, eyes and we see the contraction of the pupil. Okay, so very simple. Uh, this is a very simple test. I think all of you have done this many, many times. So we're going to just give it a quick go. Okay, so I'm going to use a light source. In this case, I don't have a flashlight with me. So I'm going to use the ophthalmoscope, which I have right here, but it, you can use your cell phone. You can use any, any light source is okay. Right. 
we explain to the patient what we're going to do. So uh, musical, what, we're, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to shine a bright light into your eyes. Okay. And I just want you to look straight. I know it's a bit uncomfortable, but just try to be patient. Okay, so this is basically what we're going to do. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my hand here in the middle to avoid giving light to the opposite side. Okay, so we're going to avoid giving light for the opposite side. So the first step is, please look at me. We're going to test one side, and then we see that there's pupillary reaction to this side, right? And then after that, we're going to look at the other side as I stimulate this one. Remember that when we look at the nerve that goes to the eye, there's a crossover of visual fibers, right? So there's a, a percentage of these fibers that cross over to the other side. So when you stimulate one side, the other side is also going to have a much smaller contraction, right? And this is called the consensual reflex. So we have the direct pupillary reflex, and then we have the consensual reflex in which this side is also going to react to that light shape. Right? And this tells us again that, for example, this is healthy. This can be abnormal in some cases. For example, patients who have a tumor, uh, especially like a, a from the hypotheses or something, then sometimes there's compression on the optic chiasm, and then there can be some alteration in, in this reflex, right? Also, these patients tend to have headaches and a bunch of other symptoms, but this is just one test that we can use to help us distinguish between them. Okay, so it's one, one useful thing that you can do when you're doing your uh, exam. This is very useful also in cases of trauma, right, or in cases of, of any kind of disturbance of the consciousness to see what's going on. We know also that many drugs have an impact on the contraction of the pupil. So again, if you have pinpoint pu pupils or, or other types of pupils that are non-reactive or different, then you might encounter some of these uh, things when you, when you examine the patient. So this is a very common test that we do in most patients in the emergency room setting, right? If it's in primary care, well, usually it's not, not so common, but you can still do it as part of your examination. Okay, great. So let's go back to our slide over here for a moment. And then finally, we're left with the fundoscopy. Oh, sorry, just for before I forget, when we're doing pupillary light reflex, remember that you need to have both cranial nerve two and cranial nerve three working, right? Because cranial nerve number two is gonna feel the light and then cranial nerve number three is going to actually produce the contraction of the pupil. So if cranial nerve two is damaged, then it, you won't be able to perceive the light. Or if cranial nerve number three is damaged, then you will not be able to contract the pupil even if you can perceive the light. So it requires both of them to be intact in order for this reflex to happen. And then finally, we're going to talk about the fundoscopy. And for the fundoscopy, uh, we're going to be uh, actually doing a fundoscopy together. So, so I've got some cool equipment here that I want to show you today. Uh, this is a panoptic ophthalmoscope. I'm going to put it a little bit closer so you can see it. This is a panoptic ophthalmoscope, right? And uh, this is a really nice ophthalmoscope. It has a very wide view, so you can see a lot. And it's much better than the small ones, right? Those small ones are not so good, but this, this is actually really, really good. And what I've done here is I've, it, it comes with this attachment. And this attachment, uh, you can put in your iPhone here. Unfortunately, it's, it's kind of still for iPhone 6, so it's a bit old. Um, but uh, you put your iPhone here, and you can actually see, right, the image from the ophthalmoscope right, on your phone. And you can take pictures, you can take videos. So this is really cool for teaching, or for example, if you're seeing a diabetic patient, you want to document their, their, their changes in the retina, this can be very, very useful, right? So very, very useful tool. For, for you if you're doing this kind of examination. Okay, so a uh, quick question. How many of you have done fundoscopies before? Is this something that, that, that you feel comfortable with or is it something that, that, that you still find challenging to do? Because uh, for example, when, when I was in medical school, I had a lot of trouble doing this. It was very, very difficult for me to get a hang of this. Um, and, uh, and I don't know, I had some difficulty getting to, to see the structures inside the eye, for example, being able to see the optic disc, it took me a lot of effort for that. So I'm very curious to see. Okay, some of you have done it. Some of you have never done it. Okay, thanks for sharing, Balance and Michael. Okay, Aaron says yes. Okay, when we were in the ophthalmology. Okay, so you did it in the ophthalmology department. Okay, great, great. So we have kind of a mix of different things, right? Some of you have had this experience before. Some of you have not. So what we're going to do 
is first we're going to review the external technique, and then I'm going to show you what I'm looking at here. Okay, so so first of all, let's 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 review the technique. Remember, I mentioned that we have like a 15 degree angle. So when you want to see the fungus, the most important thing is we need to place ourselves more or less at a 15 degree angle. So I'm going to hold this here, right, like this. Put my fingers on the patient's forehead to stabilize it, and then I'm going to approach the eye like this. What's going to happen is we're going to be able to see something called the red reflex. It's like a red reflection, which is the light of the ophthalmoscope hitting the retina, and then it flashes back. This is what happened. Have you ever had those pictures in which everybody has these crazy shiny eyes? That's the red reflex, and that's actually good. In children, it's very difficult to do this test because they don't cooperate. But the red reflex can show us what's going on with the retina. For example, if a child has a retinoblastoma, right, a tumor in the retina, what's going to happen is they'll have red reflex on the healthy side, and then the, the, the side where the tumor has no reflex because the surface is irregular. So this can be a really good test to do in children if you're checking for retinoblastoma, so children that you suspect have some kind of visual problem or some other issues like that. Okay, but let, let's get down to it. And what we're going to do is we're going to actually try to do this. So I'm going to be sharing my screen with you here. Uh, let me see if I can do that. Share screen and... Okay. Okay, great. Are you guys able to see the view from the, from the fundoscope? Yeah, you should. Everybody should be able to observe the view from the fundoscope right now. Like I can show you. Yeah, is it working? Fantastic. Okay, thank you, Michael. Okay, so as I said before, the first step is we're going to turn on our our, our light, right, so that we have a good light source. We're going to make sure everything is is set, right, and ready to go. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hold the ophthalmoscope like this, right, and I'm going to approach our patient. Okay, and then the first step is we're gonna check for red reflex. So do you see how there's that red reflection in the eye? And a bit closer, see if we can get that. There we go. You see that, that reflection in the eye? That is the retina, right? So the light is bouncing off the retina and showing us that red color, right? That looks a bit spooky in the picture. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, musical, we're gonna be looking inside of your eye. Okay, so what I would like you to do for me is, do you mind holding your hand out like this, right? And I just want you to look at your thumb, okay? Can you keep, just keep looking at your thumb, even if I cross in front of you. Some people like to do this with the wall, but I like to do it with the thumb because I can actually move the thumb around and it can change her point of view. So, so it's kind of very useful in that sense. Okay, so, so now she's looking at her thumb here, I can see, right? She's looking at this, and now we're going to uh, come a little bit closer. And about 15 degrees, please keep looking at your thumb. Okay, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna approach the patient and we're gonna see how suddenly the fungus becomes more obvious here. So you can see, you see the optic disc right there, right? You can observe the optic disc, the retinal blood vessels, right? You can observe here, let's pull out a little bit and let's go back inside, see if we can get a better view. There we go. So there we have a nice view of the optic disc, right? Okay, thank you, Misako. Okay, so were you guys able to see that? Yeah, were, were you able to identify the optic disc when we were doing the test? Let us know, or if you want, I can try it again. If you want me to do it one more time, I can do it one more time, no problem. Here you might find that it's a bit difficult to see. It looks very small because it's a very bright environment because we're shooting video. So it's a bit difficult for her to, to, to dilate the, the pupil, right? So cool, okay, amazing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's pretty cool tech, right? Okay, so everybody was able to more or less distinguish some of those structures, right? Okay, if you would like me to do this again, just let me know in the chat and I can do it again later on and so that you can get a, another look at this really cool stuff. But as you notice, it's very easy. It's very easy. All you have to do is approach the eye at 15 degrees, right? And you will able to do it. Yeah, it's, it's not quite clear. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, this is not the ideal setting, Michael. So 
Uh, it's very bright. Okay, one more time. Okay, cool. Let's, let's try it one more time. Okay, praise. No problem. Let's try one more time. And okay, I'm going to just try to dim some lights. Okay, I'm going to try to get off some lights. Just be patient. Give me a moment. And we're going to try to dim just a few lights to see if we can get a better, better view. Okay, so. Okay, musical. So I'm going to ask you to please look forward at your, at your finger. Okay, we're going to try it one more time. Okay. A little bit more this way here. There we go. And just keep looking here. Try not to move your eyes as much as possible. Okay. okay, so we're going to approach the eye. Oh, sorry. I need to turn on the light. That usually helps, right? Make sure we're, we're got good focus here. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold this here. Okay, just keep your eyes still. Keep your eyes still. There we go. And we're going to approach the eye. See if we can get inside. And there we can see the optic disc. See, it's nice and round, and it's got the retinal blood vessels inside. Cool. Okay, did that work? Michael, was it easier to see this time? Praise, did you manage? Yeah, it's, it's a really useful test, guys, because, for example, if you have a patient that has increased uh, increased pressure in the brain or has inflammation of the optic disc, this could suggest that there's some kind of intracranial hypertension situation, right? And if the patient has edema of the optic disc, in which it's going to appear very blurry, it's going to look very, very blurry. And if you find this, we should never, never do a lumbar puncture, right? Because we can have a herniation of the brain and this can produce terrible, terrible problems. Patients can die very easily from that. So it's an important test to know how to do. It's also very important in other types of patients, for example, patients with diabetes mellitus or patients with hypertension. But today we're focusing on the central nervous system. So I'm not going to talk too much about the retinal blood vessels or exudates or other types. What we're doing right now is we're looking only at the optic disc because that is our objective for today. Cool. Okay, everybody. So let's go back and let's continue. Oh, why am I looking at an eye. Okay, there we go. That's that's me. Oh, sorry. I just need to get my lights back on. Sorry, just a moment. Okay, we're back. We're back. Okay, great. Okay, so that was the fundoscopy. 15 degrees. Oh, that's a great question. Okay, so 15 degrees. So if you approach the eye straight like this, let, oh, sorry, I'm in the wrong side. So if you approach the eye straight in a straight line, uh, let me see. Oh, God, it's so difficult to do here. Okay, so let's imagine we, we want, we make a line and this is directly looking at the eye, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to go 15 degrees to the side like this. And then that way you can see where the optic disc is located. The optic disc is not straight. It's a little bit medial, right? So you need to twist a little bit your your ophthalmoscope right if you go straight it's not going to work you want to twist it just about 15 degrees so that it's going to enter a little bit from the side of the eye so not straight ahead but from 15 degrees let me know if that's understandable if it didn't answer your question i can try to show you in a different way okay great so uh again this is a really uh, easy test to do and again, we just want to a little bit offset to the right, follow the red reflex all the way in, and suddenly the disc will become visible, right? So that's basically the procedure. Fantastic, I'm glad you got it. That's great, that's great. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at our, no, our next test over here. This is the normal fundus, right? And as you can see, what we were seeing is just a very small part of this. We never see all this together, right? If you're using a, another type of equipment. But with the handheld equipment, we just see a small portion, a little circle of this over here. So something like this, this like this big usually is more or less what you're going to be able to see. And then that's what we can actually appreciate in this type of exam. Okay, great. Now, the other thing we're going to be talking about is the extraocular muscles, right? So, so there are several muscles and they're innervated by three cranial nerves. So, so just three cranial nerves just for your eye. Can you imagine? So that's four cranial nerves in total that are just for your eye. That's how important eyes are, right? And uh, one way that we can uh, remember 
These are SO4, so superior oblique 4. Uh, lateral rectus 6, so LR6, and all the rest are innervated by 3. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? So 3 is the ocular motor eye, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to participate in eye movement, and also it's going to participate on in the pupillary contraction. Remember, we said the motor aspect of the pupillary contraction, and also uh, it participates in the eyelid. So that's why people with lesions of cranial nerve number 3 sometimes have a droopy eyelid. So you're going to feel the eyelid is kind of a, a bit droopy. And this is a typical from number three. Number four is the trochlear nerve. And this controls just one muscle, the superior oblique. And this is really cool because it's it lets you rotate your eye. So if you notice, when you move your head slightly like this or like this, what you're seeing does not change, right? The, the whole world doesn't flip. You kind of keep seeing the same thing, even if you rotate your head a little bit, right? If you rotate a lot, then suddenly the image is going to change. So you rotate a little bit, your eyes are going to be rotating with you to compensate for your head movement. And that's why you can see stable, right? If not, then we would everything would be bouncing around when we move our head. So it's a very, very important one. We're going to talk about this. We have cranial nerve number six, which is the Abducens nerve, and this one is in charge of the lateral rectus. So the lateral rectus is the external one over here, and this is in charge of moving your eye in this direction, right? So it pulls back and moves your eye out. That's all it does. Okay, so how do we test this? Well, we have uh, two tests. One is visual tracking, and the other one is pupillary response. Okay, so let's take a look at how we're going to do this. Let's switch over to our PE cam, and we're going to continue working with Mizuho here. Uh, and then uh, the first thing we do is when we're doing visual tracking is you want to make an H shape, right, with your finger and get the patient to track your finger while you're doing that. So the finger, the, the finger is what patients are going to be tracking. Let me see if I can, ooh, it's blurry. Sorry, I, I don't have the camera, man. It's just me. So uh, it, the, the camera sometimes takes a little bit to, to change focus. But basically what we're going to do, so we're going to inform the patient. So Mizuho, what I'm going to do is I want you to look at my finger without moving your head. Okay, so only moving your eye, and I want you to follow my finger. Okay, can you do that? Very good. Okay, so let's go this way, and I'm slowly going to take the eye all the way to the edge. Okay, so I can push the eye all the way to the limit, and then I'm going to move it up. Okay, and then I'm going to take it all the way down. Right, and I'm going to be at this time, I'm observing her eyes to see. The movement of her eye to see if she's actually tracking properly all the way up all the way down and then i'm going to come to the center and i'm going to approach my eye to her face to try to test for accommodation so i'm going to just move the eye closer and see if the eyes kind of cross over in the center okay and then we can move back and we can see the eyes going back into position very important, don't point like this, right? Because it's pretty scary. Can you imagine somebody comes to your eye like this, right? It, it's not a very happy thing, right? So, so please turn your eye around so that it's a little bit less intimidating for the patient. So just a little tip there on how we can do that. Now, the other test that we can do for, a calm, for, for eye movement is we're going to hold the patient's head and I'm gonna turn her head to the right and to the left and see her eye rotation, okay? so. Just relax your head, please. I'm just going to move your head to the side. Look at me. Okay, very good. And what is happening is both eyes are going to remain at the same level, right? If she has a problem with her superior oblique muscle, then what you're going to notice is one of the eyes kind of goes up, right? And it looks kind of like right? one of the eyes goes up like this. And the, the way I remember it is like it's an oh my God sign. You know when you see the, the emoji for oh my god like looking up so that's what happens with the stick eye when you rotate the head it, it points up right so it's the oh my god oh my god sign right uh yeah sorry that's not official right don't, don't write that on the test i'm just telling you that that's how i remember but anyway so this is a little bit how we can we can do this testing of the eye so again tracking and then rotation of the head and pupillary reflex which we already did before Okay, great. So, so then let's head, let's head back and uh, let's continue talking over here about the eye. Oh, no, not this. Let's continue talking about the eye and we're going to move on to the next one. Any questions so far?
Yeah, I know it's it's kind of easier to understand this if we're face to face, but unfortunately we can't do that right now. But at least it's it's a chance to 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 do some review about this. So any big questions or any concerns or comments or are we doing okay? Yes, I hope. Okay, let me show you while I wait for some questions from you. Let me show you a couple of examples. So this is a palsy of the third cranial nerve, and you can see how on the right side of the patient, we can see some changes there. We can see how his eyelid is a little bit drooping, right? We can also see how his eye is slightly deviated, right? So this is an example of the palsy. Oh, yeah, can you explain the reason for rotating the head? Yes, very good, that's a good question. And actually, let me take you down to, to another scene so that you can see this. So the reason for rotating the head has to do with, oh, no, no, I rotated the head too much, was this little muscle up here. Oh, no, this, this part, sorry, it's very sensitive. So it's called the superior oblique muscle. And this muscle is in charge of rotating the eye so that when you move your head, you don't suddenly look at, so you can still keep the same image, right? If you move your head slightly to the sides, you can still see the same thing, right? And that's why we have this particular muscle there. So it's in charge of that. So let me just maybe switch over here. Okay, so if I turn my eye over here, or my head over like this or like this, right? My eye's still gonna keep looking at the same image, right? The world does not switch over, right? If you do this, it looks exactly the same as, as before. So because my eyes are rotating to compensate for that movement, if there was a damage to that nerve, to that muscle, if that muscle stopped working, my eye is not going to compensate anymore. So what's going to happen is when I turn, this eye is going to be okay, but this eye is going to point in a different direction. Right? It's going to point up and inside a little bit like this. So this is what we call the um, the uh, palsy of cranial nerve number four, which is the trochlear nerve or pathetic nerve, also called in other, in other, in other textbooks. But basically, it, this is why we do this test. Uh, I don't know if that explanation is clear enough. If not, please let me know, and I will try to explain again in an easier way. As I said, it's a bit difficult to, to do this uh, online, but I'll, I'll try my best to, to be as clear as possible. Okay, great. Uh, the other one here, here we have a cranial nerve number six palsy. Remember, we said the cranial nerve is the lateral rectus muscle, right? So when she looks to one side, everything is fine. But when she looks to the opposite side, right? When she looks that way, no, this way, sorry. When she looks, oh God, this is terrible. When she looks this way, right? Then you're going to notice that one eye does not follow. One eye stays in the center, and then the other one is able to move. So this is a cranial nerve six palsy, right? So we can see this kind of finding in the patient. So it's kind of one eye does not move uh, externally, right? That, that's basically the sign that we're gonna find. Okay, here's another interesting uh, picture that we can see. Uh, for example, this is called Horner syndrome. And what you can see here is there's a combination on the left eye of this patient, right? The patient has meiosis, which is contraction of the pupil. And you can also see her eyelid is kind of a little bit dropped, right? And we call this ptosis. So meiosis and ptosis together in the same eye is are the typical findings of Horner's syndrome. And uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that here, but if you are interested in Horner's syndrome, I do recommend to go and check it out on a textbook or online. I don't I don't use books anymore. I, I check everything online because there's so much stuff online that it's it's. It's kind of unnecessary. I used to carry the, the, the Harrison when I was a student. Fortunately, you guys can do everything online, so that's so cool. I wish I had been born a little bit later. Anyway, uh, enough of that. So, <laughs> great. Okay, so this brings us to our next test, which is the which is the cranial nerve number five or trigeminal nerve. Okay. Do doctors routinely do this exam? That's a good question. For the eye rotation, only if you find eye findings. So if the patient comes and is complaining about visual symptoms, right, um, and you notice that their eyes are a little bit unusual, right, and you're not sure if something is wrong or not, and then in that case, we would go ahead and do that. Yeah, we rotate the, so we rotate the eye. Again, this happens a lot in patients who have strokes or tumors or things like that. 
that have uh, any abnormality of vision, then we can do those tests to see if there's any damage with the superior oblique muscle, right? Or cranial nerve number four, right? Which is the one who's in charge of that muscle. So we don't do it all the time, but if you have a patient coming in with a history compatible with stroke or transient ischemic attack, and you look at their eyes and they look a little bit unusual, then we would do that. In that case, it would be indicated. So it's just to kind of try to do a quick evaluation about what's going on, right? Of course, we might get some imaging as well later on, but this is a test that we can do sometimes to evaluate if something is wrong. Uh, this is this particular one with the with superior oblique. It's a, sometimes found in children, right? And then the mom brings the kid in. Oh, look! I don't know why his eye looks weird. And then you're like, oh, what's going on? And that's when a good time to to move that to do that test of, of rotation of the head. But it's not a standard test. It's not something that you usually encounter in OSCE, but it is a good test to know if you're doing that. Right. Okay, so let's continue. Trigeminal nerve. Now, the trigeminal nerve is a very interesting nerve because it actually has three parts, right? And uh, what it does, it does it's going to participate in the sensitivity of the face and mouth. And also, it's a, it has a motor function. So it's a dual nerve, motor and sensory. Sensory is basically for the face, and the chew, and then the motor one is the this muscles in charge of chewing. So it innervates two muscles in particular. One is the temporalis muscle and the masseter. Okay, so let's maybe switch to the PE cam, and I can show you in more detail about this. Oh no, this one. PE cam. Okay, there we go. So what we're going to find is this particular um. Uh, trigeminal nerve has a couple of different branches. If I'm not mistaken, it should be this one. Oh, where's this? It's this one. Oh, oh God, this is so difficult. Facial nerve it should be here somewhere. Okay, here. Okay, anyway. So basically, it innervates the temporalis muscle that you see here is highlighted and the masseter. Right? So, and these are the muscles that let you chew, right? Actually, if you look at people who chew gum a lot, they have really big temporal muscles. Uh, you can actually feel those. So um, I, I know chewing gum is not so common anymore, but you know, in the 80s, everybody was chewing gum like crazy and they had some huge temporal muscles. It was quite interesting. So these two muscles are innervated by the trigeminal nerve, which is the facial, which, which is in charge of the, the, these two muscles. And then for the sensory part, and let me just maybe add, it's going to innervate the face, right? So it's going to innervate, uh, let's put some skin on this lady. So it's going to be innervating this area over here, right? Which is V1, right? We have V2, which the second branch is going to be innervating this area here. And we have a mandibular branch, which is going to be innervating this part over here, right? Uh, this is an important nerve because sometimes when people get dental work done, this nerve can become irritated. And these patients suddenly have symptoms. So this is an important nerve to remember because it's 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 a good thing to it's, it's good to examine when you have patients with symptoms. Okay, so let's go back to our P, and uh, we're going to continue here. And Mizuho, would it be possible for you to take off your mask again, please? Okay. So the first thing I want to evaluate is the motor portion. Okay. So I'm I'm going to put my hands here, and can you please open and close your mouth for me? And I can feel how that. Temporalis muscle is contracting there. Okay, great. Now let's keep doing that. Let's do that again. Now I'm feeling the mask too, right? Open and close. Okay, now I'm feeling the contraction and the tone. It's very important to feel the tone of the muscle, right? So you can press here, you can press here. Sometimes when patients have a stroke, uh, what you can feel is there's a difference in the hardness between the two muscles. One muscle feels normal and kind of resistant, and the other muscle becomes very soft. Right? And that can be, for example, finding in stroke or in other type of, of, of condition like this. Some kind of transient ischemic attack can also have this kind of thing. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a find that you might encounter. The other part of this is the sensory aspect. And for the sensory exam, we're going to be doing a light touch examination of the face. And we're going to use a little cotton ball. And what we want to do is we want to use this, but a cotton ball is not the best way to do the test. Right, because when you press somebody with a cotton ball, what's going to happen is it's going to apply pressure, not light touch. So to do light touch, we need a cotton thread. So what we do is we take the ball and we separate it. 
And now you can see how this becomes a little bit longer, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to brush on the patient's face using these edges over here. Okay, so Mizuho, I'm, I'm going to brush on your face. I would like to please close your eyes. Okay. Can you feel this? Mm -hmm. Can you feel this? Mm -hmm. Is it the same on both sides? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. So we're doing a comparative test. You always have to be comparative when you're doing the nervous system. Can you feel this? Mm -hmm. Can you feel this? Mm -hmm. Is it the same? Yes. Okay, very good. Can you feel this? Mm -hmm. Can you feel this? Is it the same on both sides? Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. You can put your mask back on. Okay, great. So we're looking for sensory changes. Uh, one of the things, for example, that sometimes we find is hyposthesia or anesthesia. So the patient cannot feel the stimuli or for hyposthesia, the patient feels one side more than the other, right? So this is a finding that sometimes we can encounter in patients who have a stroke or have other kind of ischemic uh, event or, or some other uh, problems. So, so basically this is a useful test to do. And we do this very, very frequently. It's a very common test that we do when, when patients come in with symptoms. Okay, great. So let's go back. Oh, no, that's not me. That's the lady. This is me. And let's go back to uh, our next exam. And we're going to talk about the facial nerve. The facial nerve is a motor nerve, right? So it's in charge of innervating the muscles of the face, right? And this, these muscles are going to kind of give us an idea about what's going on with the patient, right? So, so it's very important to remember this is a, an exam that focuses on the different muscles of the face, and we're going to be doing that. Okay, so uh, what we're going to do now is I'm going to just quickly just give you some basic idea about some of the things that we would be looking for. When we when we do this test, um, here let me just set up my camera here. There we go. Okay, and let's switch off to our PE cam, and uh, let me see if we can do this. I just want to give you a bit of a close up, uh, so that we can look at the face. Okay, musical, can you please take off your mask? Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look for symmetry, right? So what I want to do is I want to evaluate the symmetry of the face. So for that, I'm going to evaluate on the lines of the face to see if there's any difference in the lines of the face. Everybody has little lines in the face, right? And we can see if there's, for example, sometimes you see that this is very low and this is very high. That can be another one. The level of the eyebrows is another important feature that we're going to be evaluating, right? We want to make sure that they're more or less similar. Remember, everybody's a bit different. Sometimes one is higher than the other, but, but still this is something important. Right? We're going to be looking at the eyes to make sure they're symmetrical. Right? We're going to be looking at the edges of the mouth. This is a very sensitive area to check for symmetry. Right? So the edge of the mouth is going to give you a lot of information. The nasolabial fold is another area that we're going to look. Right? Some patients have a very marked line here. Some patients have a less marked line, like Mizuho. But here we can see some changes in this area. And then finally, the last area where you can see some changes is over here. And this has to do with relaxation of the buccinator muscle, which is the one that goes in here in your cheek, right? And if this is and then what happens is this kind of droops down. This droops down, droops down a little bit. Okay, so always when we do an examination of muscles, we want to see and we want to touch. So the first thing is we're going to ask Mizuho to help us with a couple of uh, faces. So can you please raise your eyebrows like this? And I always show the patient. I do it too so that the patient doesn't feel very embarrassed about it. And just keep like that. And then what I want you to do is always feel, right? Try to force against the muscle and make sure that there's good resistance. Okay, very good. Mizuho, can you please close your eyes tightly? Just squeeze your eyes shut. Okay, and don't let me open them. Okay, and I'm going to try to open her eyes. Okay, and I can see there's, there's, there's similar force on both sides. Okay, very good. Uh, Mizuho, can you please smile for me? Okay, and then I can see here, again, we're going to evaluate the nasal labial folds, the edges of the mouth to see if there's any change. When people smile is when you can see most changes in the mouth. So we're going to see, make sure that that's symmetrical. Okay, very good. Relax, please. And finally, can you please puff up your cheek? That's it. Very good. And then we can puff up the cheek and then we can just gently press to see if there's resistance. Please don't put your face next to it when you're doing it because you might get a little saliva shower if you press too hard. Okay, please relax. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So that brings us to uh, um, those are the basic tests that we're going to do for cranial nerve number seven, which is the facial nerve.
How are we doing, guys? Are we still awake? Are you still with me? Yeah? Nobody sleeping yet? I know it's after lunch. It's like, oh, yeah, I know. I should take a little nap, especially now with all the COVID thing going on. Right? Yes? Okay, thank you, Taylor. Okay, at least I know Taylor's with us still. Uh, great. Michael is back. Joyce, praise Jane. Thank you guys. Awesome. You guys are lovely. Thank you so much for, for, for letting me know that you're still there. It feels much better when I can see you guys interacting as well. That way, oh, yeah, they're still listening. That's great. Thank you so much for paying attention to, to this. Okay, great. David, awake. Fantastic, my friend. Okay, so let's talk about the acoustic nerve. And this is a very interesting nerve. Uh, we do the acoustic nerve. And very quickly, I have a quiz question for you. Okay, so this is a tuning fork, right? And there's a test in which we put the tuning fork on the forehead, right? It can be either on the forehead or the vertex of the head. What is the name of that test? What is the name of the test in which you put the tuning fork on the midline of the head? Let's see if you guys catch that. And then the other test, uh, let's, let's see if we can... Let's wait for some answers. Let's, I mean, I'm interested in this one. Uh, let's see who, who if we're going to get some right answers because sometimes people get very confused. Weber's test, Jane, you are awesome. Good job, Jane. Yes, Jane was the one to answer first. This is the Weber test, right? The one we put over here. So this is a couple of very useful tests that we can do for hearing. The Rene test is the one we do on the back with the mastoid apophysis. And we're going to do both of those in just a moment, okay? So let's switch on to our PE cam and let's try this out. Okay, we're gonna try this out. PE cam coming. And okay, so let's do that. So first is the Weber's test. And we for the Weber's test, I like to use these over here. These are the big tuning forks. Do you see there's a there's a little 128 here? Uh, I don't know if it's uh, it's kind of hard to see. There we go. So it says 128 there on the screen. If you can't read it, it says 128, trust me, right? And uh this is a big tuning fork and then we have these smaller ones right and this one is a 512 and they're very different this one the big one produces a lot of vibration right so if i put this somewhere it's going to vibrate yeah you can hear that a lot right i'm going to just do it here watch out your ears you can hear that it catches a lot of the vibration right on the other hand the 512 produces more sound than vibration but if i hit that it suddenly becomes a very you can probably hear it there Sorry about that. Yes, yeah, so you can hear that sound, right? So they're a little bit different. This one is very good for weather, or if you're doing like proprioception or some other test in which you require the vibration. This one is very good for evaluating hearing, right? Particularly, for example, when you're doing Rene's test, this can be a very, very useful one to help you distinguish. But you can do it all with one, with one of these, because usually we don't carry a bunch of these in our pocket, right? We usually just carry one. So if you carry one, this the 128 can do pretty much everything. Okay, great. So let's try it out. So Mizuho, I'm going to be doing a special test in which I am going to put this on your head and you're going to hear a sound, okay? And I would like you to tell me if the sound is the same on both ears. Are you ready? Okay, let's try it. This might feel a bit weird. Can you hear the sound? Is it the same on both sides? Yeah. Great. Okay, very good. That is Weber's test, okay? And again, what we're going to do is when we put this over here, uh, again, we're going. To, the patient is gonna compare right and left. You can actually do it by yourself. If you cover one ear, you can actually produce like a false positive report result. So we're gonna cover air conduction. And I, I would like to hear from you, what is gonna happen if I cover one ear and do this test? What do you think is gonna be the outcome? While you're thinking, I'm going to try it on Mizuho, and I'm going to ask her, Mizuho, can you please cover one of your ears like this? Okay, it's completely blocked. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to put this on your head. Oh. Okay. Don't tell us anything okay. yet. Don't tell. Okay. So which side would be louder, right or left? R or L? Okay. Share that with us, and we'll be talking about that in a few minutes when you answer. Okay, the other test that we have is a Rene's test. And for Rene's test, again, we can use either the smaller tuning fork or we can, we can still use the big one, that's no problem. 
the covered side is louder. Yes, that is correct, Praise. Yes, Taylor, it is the right side. Is that correct, Mr. Hope? Was the right side louder? Yes. Correct. Okay, you guys got it. Awesome. Yay. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, so let's try our Weber test. Now, for the Weber test, we need to be very careful because sometimes people make a few mistakes with it. And one is when we do the Weber test, we need to identify the mastoid apophysis, right? This has to be placed exactly on a bony surface. If you put it on the tissues of the neck, this is not going to work. It has to be on the mastoid apophysis, and that's what we really want to accomplish. Okay, just let me maybe just to make it very, very clear, I just want to show you here on the skeleton. Let me just do that. Uh, switch over to Mr. Skeleton. Okay, so what we're looking for is, let's take away some of these muscles. No, no arteries. What we want to do is we want to put that right here on the mastoid apophysis, right? So that is the area where we want to put the 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 chain fork in order to do the test okay so very important positioning is very important okay so musical just just for practice sake can you, can you just turn around just a little bit to the right very good yeah that's it just just turn your head and i'm going to uncover uh your your head here okay and this is what we're going to do i'm going to put this behind your ear okay and you're going to hear some sound and i want you to tell me when the sound stops okay so i'm going to put it behind your ear you're gonna hear the sound and tell me when the sound stops. Okay. Are we ready? Yeah. Okay, so let's try that out. It's usually not good to do this too hard because if not, it's gonna take several minutes. Just flick. Okay, and you're gonna put this behind your ear. Can you hear the sound? Uh -huh. Okay, tell me when this stops. Oh. Okay, can you hear it now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, very good, very good. So what happened? So first we tried bone conduction, right? Which was by putting this on the mastoid apophysis. And bone, she could hear the sounds through bone conduction, but eventually the bone conduction stopped. When the bone conduction stopped, I approached the uh, tuning fork to her ear and she could still have air conduction. So that means air conduction is more sensitive than bone conduction under, under healthy circumstances. Right, so tell me, okay, this ear is working properly. So it's another important test that we can do. And of course, we do it on both sides, right? So this allows an evaluation of both sides. So again, first we put it here, bone conduction stops, and then you approach it to the ear, and air conduction should continue. That is normal, right? But if you approach it to the ear and the patient can't hear, then we know that the bone conduction is working, right? The nervous, the wires are working but something is stopping the flow of sound through the ear. So here we can think about many things. The most common thing, most cases, earwax, right? Very, very common. People have a bunch of earwax and they can't hear because the wax creates a barrier that doesn't let the sound travel. So that's been one very, very common cause, but there's some other causes, for example, uh, problems with the tympanic membrane or autosclerosis, or there's several other diseases that can produce that, or a foreign object if it's a child, right? So, but most cases it's wax. And what we would do is right after we can do an otoscopy to look inside to make sure that um, everything is okay. And I don't know, uh, I know uh, Professor Chan, I know you're you're watching this. Uh, do you find a lot of wax when you're doing when when you have patients with hearing loss? We'd love to hear from you. Okay, great. So while we hear from while we hear back from, from Professor Chan, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the the next nerve over here because we're coming up on our time. Oh wow, we're we're kind of behind schedule. This is fast. We'll do this one very quickly. Okay, cranial nerve number nine or glossopharyngeal nerve. Glosso is tongue, pharyngeal is pharynx, right? And with this one, basically what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna inspect the patient's uvula and we're going to induce a gag reflex, right? And usually we do that using a tongue depressor. We stimulate the posterior part of the mouth, right? Or the pharynx, and, and then the patient's gonna gag, right? We're not gonna be doing that right now. It's okay, musical, don't worry. We're not gonna be doing that to you. But uh, this is something that we can frequently do in patients. The other one is the cranial nerve number 10, or vagus nerve. And this nerve, like, 
is uh, like a Swiss army knife. This guy does everything. But an easy way to evaluate it is through the gag reflex. So it participates together with cranial nerve 9 in the gag reflex. And also it participates in the swallowing effect. So with these cases, what we do is usually we test the patient's ability to swallow. Right? So we, we put our fingers here. We tell the patient, okay, please swallow. And we feel how the larynx is going to move up and down during the swallowing. And this tells us cranial nerve number 10 is doing A-OK. -okay. okay. And then finally, we're going to move on to our next nerve over here. Oh, sorry. This is just an example of a cranial nerve number nine lesion, right? You can see the uvula is deviated to one side, right? And uh, question for everybody, which side is affected in this patient, the right side or the left side? So take a look at this patient and tell me which side do you think is affected, the right or the left? Okay, while you think about that one, um, let's continue because we're a bit of, a little bit on time. We're going to continue with, with the next nerve while you while we gather your answers. Uh, the other thing that we have is cranial nerve 11 or accessory nerve. The lesion is on the left, says Joyce left. Everybody's a genius today. Fantastic job, guys. That's awesome. That's awesome. Big cheer for all of you. Okay, good job. Good job. Okay. So uh, let's continue here, and we're going to move on to our next nerve, which is the accessory nerve. I realize we're right on time, so let's try to get this thing done. So uh, accessory nerve basically focuses on neck and shoulder muscles, right? And there are two typical muscles that are involved, which is the trapezius muscle, which is in charge of lifting the shoulders or shrugging, right? And the sternocleidoid muscle that is in charge of rotating the head from side to side. So those are two very good muscles to evaluate when you're testing this over here. So very quickly, let's do it. Let's check um, this over here. And Mizuko, we're going to do a, a little test. What I would like you to do is please lift your shoulders like this, right? And don't let me push them down. So we come and we try to push them down, see if there's any uh, weakness or any other problem with that. And then the other thing we're going to be doing is, uh, Mizuko, I'm going to hold your, your jaw. And uh, can you please turn your head to the right side? Okay, there we go. Don't let me turn it. Try the other side, left. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so here we have evaluated both the, the trapezius muscle and the sternocleidoid muscle with shrugging. Right? Sorry, the trapezius muscle for shrugging and the sternocleidoid muscle for face rotation. So these are just quick tests that we can do. And this brings us to our last one. We're almost there, guys. Uh, let's come over to our last cranial nerve. Lucky number 12 is the hypoglossal nerve and the hypoglossal nerve is in charge of two things one is the movement of the tongue and also it's in charge of taste usually clinically we very rarely do taste but what we could do is uh, we can check with the tongue movement and the tongue stretch so let's go ahead and do that and let's switch over to our PE cam for a moment and now we're going to go ahead and do this test uh, Mizuko, would it be okay for you to take off your mask for a moment, please? Okay, very good. And the first thing I would like you to do is please stick out your tongue. Okay, and now move it to the right and to the left. So here we can see the movement of the tongue. And again, I'm looking at the tongue to see if there's any strange motion. Like, like sometimes they, we can see like, like movement, a normal movement of the tongue or impairment. Okay, thank you. You can put your tongue away. And now we want to check for strength of the tongue, right? Okay, so. Mizuko, can you please press your tongue against your cheek, right? And then now that she's pressing her tongue against her cheek, I'm just going to push her tongue a little bit, right, to feel the motor strength of the tongue. Let's try the other side, please. And we're going to try the thing on the other side. Okay, thank you very much. You can remask again. And that concludes our cranial nerve number 12 exam, which is the last exam of the cranial nerve. Okay, so let's go back. And uh, that completes our 12 cranial nerves that we managed to do in one hour. Uh, again, if you have any questions, I'm very, very happy to take a few moments to answer those. Uh, but basically, this is how we do the 12, 12 cranial nerves. Now, you're probably wondering, do we need to do 12 cranial nerves on every single patient? The answer is no, no. We just do them one if we suspect there's a deficit, 
do if the patient has a complaint that could make you suspicious that that particular uh, nerve is involved. Okay, so this is not something we do on all our patients. No, because it takes a long time. We did, a, you know, we were doing a little bit of talking, but it took us like good one hour to do it. If you're doing it in a real patient, it might take like 10 minutes, but 10 minutes is really a lot of time to do for a physical test. So usually we will not do everything, but we will select the tests based on the patient's history and based on our clinical suspicion. So then the test will help us confirm what we're suspecting, right? Uh, so this is a very, very good way to, to kind of go ahead and, and try to understand better what the characteristics of the neurological deficit are. Right? And this can be very, very useful. Okay, everybody. So this brings us to the end of our session for today. I do apologize for the little mishap that we had today. Um, and uh, again, if you are interested on the rest of the, of the neurological exam, we can try to cover some of that in the future. But for today, unfortunately, uh, we're just focusing to the cranial nerves, but at least we had a chance to, to look at these in detail and to talk about them and talk about the proper examination of these nerves. Um, with physical exam, honestly, most of it is practice, right? So if you practice very hard, you will develop the skills and it will become a lot easier. It's just like riding a bicycle, right? At the beginning, it's a little bit difficult and you're not too sure what you're doing, but then after you do it several times, you know, you kind of get used to it. And suddenly you start getting quite good at it, right? The next thing you know, you're like letting go of the weed, the handle and spinning your bike in the air and all that cool stuff that people put on YouTube. So anyway, um, that's our, our neurological exam. I do encourage you to practice as much as possible, uh, particularly if you have a patient with a finding, it's a great opportunity for you to learn how to study that, how, how to see those clinical signs and how to detect those changes. So I want to thank you again for your time today. It's always a lovely opportunity to be able to be with you. And also I would like to thank uh, Mizuho for helping us today. So thank you Mizuho very much for your help. You were awesome and we really appreciate your help. And uh, again, uh, it's all about the practice guys. So, so let's get to practice. Let's try to do that. I heard some really good news that, that uh, apparently uh, we're, we're, you guys are going to be able to go back to the hospital pretty soon. So I'm looking forward to seeing you again. And, and again, uh, thank you so much for all your support. If you have not subscribed to the channel, please help us out and subscribe. When we reach a certain number of subscriptions, we can, we can get our, our private domain, kind of a private name for the, for the website. And it makes it much easier for people to share. So if you have not subscribed yet, please make sure to hit that subscribe button. And if you like today's video and the topics, please make sure to hit a like on the video because the likes for each video are kind of our guide to see what you guys feel comfortable with or what you don't feel comfortable with. So if you enjoyed the video today and you like this kind of topic, make sure to like it so that I know that, oh yeah, they like this kind of material, right? And that way we can try to create more sessions like today. Anyway. Thank you so much, guys. Please stay safe, stay positive. These are tough times, but you know what? Things are going to get better and we're going to go back to normal eventually. So please just hang in there, right? Be positive and hopefully I'll be seeing you in person very soon. And don't forget, next Monday, we don't have a session because it's a national holiday and you guys are going to be relaxing and chilling. But next Friday, we're going to be talking everything about abdominal pain. So make sure to join us next Friday. Same time, same place, and I'll see you very soon.